Hello and welcome to Sophie Ridge on Sunday. After months or years of a political roller coaster where you can't focus on anything apart from the fact you're being hurled upside down every five minutes, there's one thing that's suffered, our focus on policy. Well, on the show today, we want to begin to correct that. The parties are beginning to come up with a policy platform for the next election. The Health Secretary with his plan for the NHS workforce, for instance, and today Labour is launching their plan for teachers. We'll talk about what the two parties want to talk about, but also what they don't. What's a fair pay rise for workers in a time of inflation? Coming up on the show today, in just a moment, we will hear from the Health Secretary, that is Steve Barclay. And for Labour, we'll speak to the party's Shadow Education Secretary, Bridget Phillipson. With more teaching strikes in the next few weeks and an even bigger row about wider public sector pay on the horizon, we'll talk to the General Secretary of the biggest education union, that is Dr Mo Boosted of the NEU. The Green businessman Del Vince is a big donor to the Labour Party. He also funds the protest group Just Stop Oil, so we'll talk to him on the programme too. Plus, we'll have a really fascinating insight into life in number 10 under the last four Prime Ministers and the current one by the man who captured them all on film, Downing Street photographer Andrew Parsons. Hello, good morning. Well, this week we've got the very long-awaited workforce plan for the NHS. It's meant to deal with a long-term staffing crisis, but with consultants and junior doctors on strike in the coming weeks and another pay round on the horizon. It's the short-term problems in the health service that remain a big problem for the government. A little earlier, I spoke to the health secretary, Steve Barclay. There's been another night of violence in Paris. Are you monitoring the situation closely? Well, it's something that the Foreign and Commonwealth Office will be monitoring very closely. They keep regular updates on their website. Uh, and what I would say to anyone concerned about it who's thinking of travelling to France to keep an eye on the Foreign Office website, there'll be regular updates there, uh, and that will keep people informed. And there was one other story in the newspapers today that I wanted to ask you about before talking about the NHS. Um, the Sunday Telegraph are reporting that overhead cables and pylons are going to be fast-tracked through the planning system. Is that true? Well, there's a balance to be struck. We don't think the approach on uh, energy is to add £28 billion to our national debt. That is the proposal okay, that yeah, Labour yeah. We know, are we, coming we, with. We've we got the attack so line in. Let's find to, out what you're going to do. What we need to do is look at how we speed up infrastructure and how we do so in a smart way that reduces cost, but balances that with the voice of residents. So it's important we take on board uh, local concerns, we respond to residents, we have the right level of consultation, but there are smarter ways of speeding up infrastructure um, and we should be looking at that because that's a way of bringing costs down whilst also getting the balance right in terms of listening to local people. And also it sounds like if the UK is going to deliver on the net zero pledge, that's going to mean more wind power, it's going to be more electric cars. I mean, that's pressure on the national grid. You've got to do something. Well, we've made huge progress so far. There's been a 500% increase in renewable energy since 2010. We're the second uh, best in Europe for that. So huge progress has been made. But at the same time, we should be looking at how do we bring costs down. Rather than adding debt, making things more expensive, as Labour want to do, we want to bring the cost of these schemes down and look at how we work in a smarter way. So fast-tracking through planning sounds like it's going to happen? Well, it's looking at, for example, the huge amount of money that's often spent on consultants, endless reports, things that take a long time, often then for the same decision to be reached. So it's about how do we get the decision right, how do we listen to local people. That is hugely important but in may be rolling these them. out, but doing so in a balanced way. And I think often a lot of money is going on consultants writing reports, taking a long period of time. We think we can work smarter than that and bring the cost down. OK. Uh, now, this week you launched your NHS workforce plan, so your plan to train and keep more staff in the NHS. You've already done interviews on it, so I don't want to spend too long uh, dwelling on the details. But there's one question that I haven't really seen anyone ask you. £2.4 billion over five years. Where's that money coming from? Well, it's through uh, cross-government, through the Treasury. That was part of the discussions we had. And it signalled the Prime Minister and the Chancellor's personal support what, what for does, this. What does that mean, then? Is, is it more money to your department, or are you going to have to find it from NHS existing budgets, or is it borrowing? What, where's it coming from? So this is additional money. It will be announced as a former Chief Secretary. It will be announced in the usual way uh, through fiscal events. Uh, it ramps up because, obviously, one of the features of the workforce plan, and it is the biggest ever expansion, in workforce training in the NHS. It's a hugely historic moment as we celebrate the 75th 
anniversary of the NHS, the fantastic achievements of the NHS. It's a major commitment from the government and it reflects the, the Prime Minister's personal commitment to the NHS, coming from an NHS family, both his parents worked in the NHS and the Chancellor has long okay. called for a long-term workforce plan. So it reflects their support. It's 2.4 billion of additional funding. So, uh, that will be announced by the Chancellor in the usual way at the next fiscal event. So but it's additional funding to the department. So I haven't heard any you know, tax rises or spending cuts, so I'm assuming this sounds like it might be extra borrowing. 100% of GDP, that's the current level of debt. Interest rates rising, so the cost of service in government debt is going up. Is that really responsible? Well, it scales up, Sophie. So first year, obviously, you only have one year of people being trained. In the second year, that doubles 2 .4 as those billion. medical... If Labour, scales... if Labour announced a policy of £2.4 without saying how that money was coming from, you would be after them like a rocket. It scales up. You've got to see that in terms of the way the doubling of medical undergraduates works is obviously that is cumulative because the second year you've got double the number, the third year triple. So that scales up over time. But also it helps in terms of the cost of agency, the cost of bank uh, and other support. So it's important to our retention, in the NHS, if we have uh, more NHS staff staying, that is a cost-effective approach. So what the plan is about is training more, yes, but also how do we have better retention and also how do we deliver that training in more efficient ways through reform. So there's three elements to the plan, not just the increase in numbers, but also the work on training and reform. The one thing that could also help the NHS recruit and retain staff is better pay. Um, the independent pay review bodies will soon publish their recommendations about the uplift that mm. health workers mm. should get. Will you stick by what they recommend? Well, we'll take those decisions on a, a cross-government basis. I'm very pleased we've now reached agreement with the largest group within the NHS, <coughs> excuse me, which is the Agenda for Change uh, workforce. That's 1.3 million people within the NHS where the government and the NHS Staff Council has reached agreement. That means those staff will get uh, the pay uplifts in their uh, pay packets this month. So that shows the progress that we are making. In terms of the wider PRB, that is something that is discussed cross-government. It's not just an issue within health. It also affects, for example, teachers and the education mm -hmm. unions, affects other departments in government. So we'll have those discussions on a cross-government basis. But it's hugely positive that we have reached agreement with the largest of the health bodies, the 1.3 million covered by Agenda for Change. It's weird that you won't say that you'll stick to the pay review recommendations, because this is what you said about them last year, um, when you're talking about pay there, and you tweeted to say, we have an independent pay review body, which the unions campaign to set up, and we will continue to defer to that process to ensure decisions balance the needs of staff and the wider economy. So you'll defer to the pay review body when you like what they say, but you reserve the right to ignore them when you don't. I think when I was on the show previously, you criticised me for adhering to the full pay review body because there was a, a pressure to go further. There was questions in terms of, because of the change in inflation, you were saying we shouldn't just stick to the full pay review body, we should actually go further. And indeed, the government did. I'm putting the different in, so, views forward, so, as you would expect me to do. My, my, course, I'm just but, trying to work out why your position, you're the health secretary, right? You're the one who has actually influence. I'm just a lowly TV reporter. I've got no say over uh, what pay all these people get. <coughs> why do you say that you should defer to the pay review process when you like what they say and not when you don't. Well, the point we discussed when this was raised last time, and you bring the quote up from last time, which is why I'm mm -hmm. making the point, was well, we should also tweet, look at the quote. wider economic circumstance. And that was the point that you were raising with me last time, sure. Sophie. And that's what and you say did. here. And you say did. you should balance the needs of staff and the wider economy. Now you're saying, actually, we just need to look at the wider economy, not the needs of staff. No, no, no. That's we, what the pay we, review body does. They, we they, need they look do, at that we stuff, We need to right? do both, and that's exactly what we have done with the Agenda for Change, which is why not only did we uh, apply the full pay review body recommendations, we actually went further in terms of a lump sum for staff because we hugely recognise the pressure that NHS staff have been under from the pandemic and older population, advances in medicine, enabling more to be done. Uh, we both adopted the full pay review body, but we actually went further last time. Of course, we need to look at the wider pressures in terms of inflation, our commitment to halving inflation, growing the economy, reducing debt, as well as cutting waiting times and stopping the boat. So we need to look at these things in the round. That's what we did last time, which is why we made adjustments. Of course, we will take a similar approach this time. They're expected to recommend a 6% rise for NHS staff. Would that be acceptable to you? Well, as I say, these will be discussions that I have on behalf of 
uh, the health workforce with the Prime Minister, the Chancellor, that the Education Secretary will have on behalf of teachers and other ministers will have uh, across government. So we will have those and we'll make announcements in due course. Um, you were earlier in the interview saying it's great that you have reached agreement with some uh, people who work for the NHS, um, but of course junior doctors is mm. outstanding. Uh, they're planning their longest ever strike later this month, Thursday the 13th to Tuesday the 18th of July. Will that put lives at risk? Well, it's hugely concerning uh, and hugely grateful to those within the NHS who have stepped up when we've had past junior doctor strikes, who, who come in, often change their holiday plans to provide uh, cover. Uh, the junior doctors are continuing to demand a 35% pay rise. I, I don't think that is affordable in the context of the inflation and the other Is pressures. that true? They say that they want to get around the table and actually thrash something out, but you don't want to talk to them, do you? Well, we have, and we had three weeks of talks. Not only that, they asked to bring a, an intermediary in, a, a very senior uh, respected NHS leader, Cathy McLean, who had played a pivotal role in a previous dispute between uh, SAS doctors uh, and the department. The department agreed to bring it in uh, that intermediary, but notwithstanding uh, Cathy's uh, excellent work, the discussions that we had with the junior doctors to date, they have refused to move from a 35% demand. Where they talk of an additional year using 2024-25, actually they demand a 49% increase because of that additional year. So I don't think that in the context of the wider economy, the need to get inflation down, that is a fair demand. Of course, both sides need to move. We are willing to do so in government. We have accepted the use of the intermediary that the BMA Why don't you get for, around the table with them now? Been, it seems well, a bit arrogant, doesn't it, if you won't even talk to them now? Well, we're being consistent, not just in health, but in all departments, uh, that if people uh, suspend the strikes, then we can get round the table, have talks. In the moment, the junior doctors have walked away from the talks. We were in the middle of discussions with them. There were a range of other factors that they have raised with me in terms of uh, annual leave that is often cancelled at short notice, rotors that have changed, some of the wellbeing issues around uh, circumstances in hospitals. So we're happy to discuss those. We were in the middle of discussing some of those wider non-pay issues. It was the junior doctors, sadly, who walked away from the discussions and called a further strike. Now, one of Rishi Sunak's five pledges was to cut NHS waiting mm. times. How's that going? Oh, well, we're making progress on our longest waits. That's what the plan uh, committed to. We virtually eliminated the two-year waits last summer. We committed to uh, reducing the 18-month waits. We cleared over 90% of those. And if you contrast our performance with Labour run uh, the NHS in Wales, we're making much more progress. So we've got a population 18 times the size of the, the NHS of... in Wales. If you just let me finish, the population in England is 18 times the size of that in Wales. We virtually eliminated our two year waits in the summer. We got our 18 month waits to down below 12,000. Yet in Wales, that was 30,000 for two year waits and around 70,000 for 18 month wait. So we're making much more progress than we see in Labour and Wales. And yet, Keir Starmer says that's if the you, blueprint for a Labour government. If you forgive me for coming in, yeah. um, thank you very much. Um, the number of people waiting for routine treatment has risen from 7.2 million to 7.4 million. I mean, most people would say that does not look like progress. Most people who are experiencing what's going on in the NHS would not say that looks like progress. If you look at the plan that was set out in 2022 by NHS England, it always anticipated that the bounce back from the pandemic would mean that in terms of the overall size of the list, it may continue to grow. In so fact, why that did plan Richie Sunak say it was going to cut about, NHS That plan talked about times. it coming down in March of next year. Now, what we're doing is fast-tracking things like our diagnostic centres. We've got 108 open. Uh, now we're going to have 160 open shortly. That's delivered 4 million additional tests and scans. We've got more treatment being, capacity being rolled out, 43 new and expanded surgical hubs. So we're boosting our treatment. That takes time to come on stream. We're making progress. We're cutting the longest wait okay. and we're fast-tracking the capacity to bring the overall size of the waiting list down. I just want to be honest. You know, looking at the five pledges that Rishi Sunak made that he said he wanted to be judged on, and it seems like you guys are on pretty shaky ground. You know, halve inflation, stop the boats, cut debt. When the Prime Minister announced them six months ago, he said simply, no tricks, no ambiguity, we're either delivering for you or we're not. What happens if you're not? 
Well, the Prime Minister was clear these were tough targets that he set himself, and rightly so. Well, most people take... thought they were easy, that they were low bars. Well, you can now see that there were tough targets that were set, and it was right that we did so. And after take waiting lists, the plan is working. We cleared the longest waits, the two-year waits the last summer. The plan is working on waiting lists. We cleared, we cleared the longest waits. Well, what the plan set out was the target the longest waits. We cleared the two-year waits last summer. We cleared over 90% of the 18-month waits. We're now focused on the 65 week waits, that's the next element of the plan, and we're massively accelerating the rollout of our diagnostic centres, our through surgical the, hubs, through in the order five to bring pledges, the overall quantum down. Through the five pledges around the economy, but debt is 100% of GDP, the economy grew by 0.2% in April, inflation's far higher than expected. You know, what happens when the guy who says he's the one to fix the economy doesn't actually fix the economy? Well, you see that the because we've had two 100-year events, of course, there's been huge pressures, and these are not alone to the economy in England. There are we specific see them, uh, issues for our economy. You will acknowledge that. Uh, so no, you're we, a smart oh, guy, you know that. Well, we're growing the economy. We recognise the OECD, recognised uh, that recently, the progress that has been made. But, of course, we've had two 100-year events. Those have had an impact. Okay. But if you look at the progress we're making in health, the rolling okay. out of national lung cancer screening this okay. week... The, and now, I guess, you know, the question was what happens if the guy who says he fixes the economy doesn't fix the economy? And I think, I think really we know people will start turning away from the Conservative Party. A poll in the Sunday Telegraph by opinion finds you're on course for the biggest by-election defeat in British history mid Bedfordshire, with Nadine Dorsey's seat. And before you say it's just one poll, I think we can have a look at our Sky News poll tracker, which shows, unsurprisingly perhaps, you know, the Conservatives are still well behind Labour, not much sign of that improving at all. At what point do you start to panic? Well, we recognise it's tough because we've had a pandemic, we've had uh, a war in Europe that's had a big impact in terms of inflation in cost of living. But look at what Labour uh, is coming forward. Nothing in terms of helping on inflation. They want to add £28 billion, uh, to our debt. That will make the problem worse. If you look at uh, stopping the small boats, there's no pro uh, proposal from Labour to do so. Absolutely silent on that. If you look at our biggest ever expansion of the workforce in the NHS this week, backed by £2.4 billion. Pounds. Labour has no proposals on reform in their equivalent plan. It was completely silent on the innovations that we're bringing forward. And what we're doing is getting on in innovating coming out of the pandemic. I take the example of lung cancer in our most deprived communities. Previously, four in five patients were diagnosed late. We've turned that on its head. It's now through our pilots, three and four, that are diagnosed early. If you look at the investment we're making in research to get the latest innovations into the NHS, £96 million we announced on Tuesday for 93 different institutions. If you look at the work on okay. mental health, often that's been an area that's been neglected. Significant additional funds, £2.3 billion more this year than okay. four years ago. So a huge amount of innovation and work is going on, but we recognise there's much more to do. Just finally, rumours of a reshuffle after the by-elections uh, next month. And I just want to read you a quote in The Times, if I may. I think you might know which is coming. Uh, most of the Cabinet, The Times says, is expected to emerge unscathed, although there continues to be speculation about the futures of Steve Barclay, the House Secretary, and Therese Coffey, the Environment Secretary. Well, of course, it's always for the Prime Minister to, to pick the, the Cabinet and his team. And uh, I've worked for three Prime Ministers, and you can see the progress we're making. As I say, if I just take this week, the lung cancer national screening, the rollout of research, uh, the progress on mental health uh, and the okay. workforce plan, and that's what I'm focused on. All right, not polishing up that CV just yet, then? Well, focused on delivery, uh, and that's what we're doing. OK, thank you very much. Well, that was the House Secretary, uh, Steve Barclay. Now, we were just talking about the staffing and the strike crisis in health fair, but, of course, things aren't much better in the education sector either, where more strikes are due and there's no resolution in sight. Meanwhile, absence rates from schools still worryingly high after the pandemic. So what would Labour do? Well, this is my interview with the party's Shadow Education Secretary, Bridget Phillipson. Thank you very much for being on the programme. Um, we know that there are issues recruiting and retaining teachers in our schools. I think one in five quit in the first two years. So what's your plan to tackle that? This is a massive problem, um, especially because we know that teacher quality is the most important factor in driving up outcomes for children and young people where it comes to what happens within school. That's why I'm setting out Labour's plans to make sure that we are supporting people into teaching. We do face this real crisis, but more importantly, that we keep them there. I think the best recruitment strategy is a really strong retention strategy. So we'll introduce 
new payments for uh, early career teachers when they complete their training. Uh, we'll reform the very complicated landscape that exists at the moment with some of those wider payments. But also Labour will insist that all new teachers coming into teaching will have to have qualified teacher status or be working towards it. For me, this is about sending a really important signal that we value and respect the work of our teachers. We know it's an incredibly skilled job and I want to reset that relationship between government and the profession. So it's a one-off payment, uh, just how much is it again? So it'll be in total £15 million, um, paid for by ending the tax breaks on private schools. So £2,400 for the individual teacher. Right. Um, I understand you know, the issues that you have in trying to keep people in the profession, but it's experienced and senior teachers who've experienced the biggest fall in real terms pay, down 13% from 2010, according to the IFS. So would you give them a pay rise? It's a complicated picture in terms of why people are leaving. I don't think there's one particular measure that will address everything. But where it comes to what I've set out around because... changes on workload, on Ofsted, on better support within our schools around mental health, there are a lot of the big challenges that school leaders and more experienced staff in my, particular my will raise with me. My question was, will you give experienced teachers a pay rise? Under the last Labour government, experienced teachers, all teachers, saw sustained pay rises. They haven't seen that. That was 13 years the... ago. They're asking what you would do now. Would if... you give them a pay rise now? Well, I think if you compare and contrast our record from last time around with the record of the Conservatives, which is a 13% real terms pay cut for teachers on average over the course of the last decade, but the economy is in a parlous state. The Conservatives crashed the economy. They were incredibly reckless in the approach that they took. We're committed to being serious about the negotiations that we would have and getting to a better position. All teachers, I believe, deserve a fair, pay, fair kind of support, fair pay for the work they do, but also to be recognised for their incredible professionalism. Um, the pay review body has recommended that teachers get a 6.5% pay rise next year. So would a Labour government accept that? Well, that's what we understand to be the case, but the government won't publish the independent pay review body's report. I want to see it. I think teachers deserve to see, to see it. School leaders who are trying to plan their budgets for September urgently need to see it. Of course you want it. to see it. Everyone wants to see it. I want to so, see it. The viewers want to see it. Would you accept a 6.5 pay rise for teachers? Well, we're speculating on what we think it no, might um, be. OK, well, my question is... I would see that as the start... I would you accept a 6.5% pay rise for teachers? I would see that as the starting point for negotiation. We can't get anywhere unless we're prepared to negotiate. We, as, so I what, what it, as I understand it... What does that mean, the starting point for negotiation? Does that mean you would want to give them more than 6.5%? Does, does that mean you want to... I, I, I just don't understand. What, so what does that mean? As I understand it, there have been no ne serious negotiations led by the Secretary of State since April. So it's little wonder that we are facing further strike action this week because she won't talk to them. She won't publish the report and she won't speak to the teaching unions. I will be talking to them, trying to find a way through it, resolving issues around pay, resolving issues around workload. And what I'm setting out this week is a really ambitious plan for how we respect and appreciate teachers for what they're doing, give them better ongoing professional development and more support for early career teachers with that new uh, retention payment, all paid for by ending the tax breaks on private schools. So would... <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry that I keep feel like you probably feel like I just keep going on about this, but the reason is because I, I don't really understand the answer that you're giving me. Would Labour accept a 6.5% pay rise for teachers? Well, I want to see the report. We all want to see the report. I'm, I'm not asking about government, the report. I'm from... just asking a straight question. 6.5% for teachers. I'm not going to come on this programme and commit to a figure. I wouldn't expect the Secretary of State to do that either. That is what will happen during the course of a negotiation where you will arrive at a position that everyone can live with. So I wouldn't expect the Secretary of State to be committing to that number. What I do expect the Secretary of State to be doing, I think what any sensible and credible government would be doing, would be trying to find a way through the impasse, publishing the report, committing to talks, getting serious about it, not constantly belittling teachers, picking fights in newspapers and focusing on peripheral, narrow issues. The most important thing that parents want to know right now is, is the teacher in front of my child's class qualified? Are they properly supported for what they're doing? And can we get these strikes to come to an end? In principle, should the government accept the pay review recommendations? Well, they've said that they will previously, so we'll wait and see what happens. We take that seriously. That's when not, that's we not were, the question. That's not when, the question when, we're the asked. I'm with... asking, you know, in principle, should a government accept the pay review uh, recommendations? That is normally what happens. Yes, that is normally what takes place. Um, what we're seeing at the moment is far from the normal kind of process. So when you've got a government that has received these reports, won't publish the reports, I think it is incredibly disrespectful. We're almost at the end of the summer term. School leaders want to plan on that basis. They don't know what their budgets are going to be. 
we need a different kind of relationship. It has to involve respecting teachers for what they're doing. We're not always going to agree. No Being one would straight with them that. about how much you've given well, in not, pay rises. I, I, if I was Secretary of State, I would absolutely be straight about that. But we're not in government at the moment. When we are in government, if we win the trust of the British people, they will have an honest, straightforward relationship with me. We won't always agree, but I'll be around that table seeking okay. to work it out and get to a better position. That is what our children deserve, not this ridiculous politicking that we see from the Tories. Teachers are striking for two more days uh, next week. Uh, disruptive for pupils, disruptive, of course, for parents as well. Do you support the strikes? It is incredibly disruptive. I don't want the strikes to happen. Most of the teachers I've spoken to recently when visiting schools tell me the last thing they ever imagined when they became a teacher was going out on strike. And in some cases, this is the first time in their career that very experienced teachers are taking strike action. But there is still time for the Secretary of State to commit to talks, to publish the report, and then hopefully those strikes could be averted. And um, I want to talk to you a little bit on childcare, a big, big issue for so many people, of course. What's Labour's offer on childcare? Uh, we'll be setting out more later this week as part of the mission that I'll be launching with Kia around the importance of making sure all of our children get a great start in life. My position is that I want to deliver a reformed and modern childcare system from the end of parental leave to the end of primary school. The first step I've set out around that is breakfast clubs for every primary school child in England. That would make a massive difference during a cost of living crisis for parents, but also for children. All of the evidence is really clear that you get better outcomes for children when you have that start to the day. In an interview with the Sunday Times in January, you said that the scale and ambition of your childcare reforms would be like the creation of the NHS. And they reported it, saying that you wanted to guarantee childcare for all parents of children aged nine months to 11 years. Are you going to do that for all uh, children and parents, or are you going to means test it? I'm going to make sure that there are childcare places available right across our country, which is not the situation at the moment uh, where again, we have providers it's, it's just, it's, it's really, it's, I'm just trying to find out what the policy is, if that's OK. Are you going to guarantee childcare for all parents of children aged 9 months to 11 years, or are you going to means test that? What I was talking about was the permanent shift that we need to see where we treat early years education and childcare as an integral part of our education system. That is the permanent shift that I want to see on a scale with the NHS because what we have in this country is early years education somewhere over here, not integral to the education system. That is very different Sounds from most of the European countries. Alongside that, making sure that where we're putting more money into the system, the government did did respond to what the pressure that we've been applying and put more money into the system at the budget. That gives us a better baseline from which to build a better system that will support parents and actually a real focus on quality of the provision because I want to make sure that particularly our most disadvantaged children get a really good start in life. At the moment, lots of those children are not accessing early years education. You see, I know how passionate you are about childcare, um, you know, about the impact it has on children or on mothers as well, perhaps from your own experience. I'm just trying to work out, you know, what happened to these reforms? Did Rachel Reeves get on the phone and say, look, you've got to scale this back, we can't afford this? What actually happened? Uh, nothing has, you know, nothing has happened in that, in that way. I'm absolutely determined to deliver early years education and childcare reform. It is a major priority for me. It will be a big priority for the next Labour government. And I know it is for Rachel too. She's spoken about the importance, quite rightly, of the economic impact of women moving out of work or cutting back on their hours because childcare isn't there. But alongside that, I want to see a real focus on making sure that all of our children get a really, really great start in life. But we have to be aware, of every, every part of what we've set out so far has been fully funded and fully costed, and that will be continue to be our position. But we, we will, if, the if we do happen to form the next Labour government, if we're so fortunate that the people, British people trust us, we will face an incredibly difficult fiscal inheritance because the Conservatives have trashed the economy and that will present us with some really tough choices. Okay. There's an, one other story that I do want to get your reaction to. Um, Catherine Bebel Singh, who is the head teacher of the very high achieving school, Michaela, in Brent, in London, she's accused your shadow cabinet colleague, Jess Phillips, of racism after a bit of a Twitter row. And she's written to Keir Starmer to say, her behaviour is a clear example of unconscious bias. I mean that she hates me, despite not knowing me, because she subscribes to the idea that black and Asian individuals in public life owe a duty to voice opinions that match with a left-wing view of the world or they are worthy of her contempt. What's your reaction to this? My reaction to anyone who feels unhappy about the conduct of a Labour MP is that they should complain through our processes and then that the matter can be looked into. Um, and as Members of Parliament, we're also subject to a Code of Conduct in Parliament as well and there are processes in place for people who are unhappy with an MP's behaviour 
uh, to report it in that way. I would suggest that to any individual that's unhappy uh, about the conduct of a member of parliament. So she thinks, you, you think that it's right for her to put in an official complaint about this? I, I think anyone who is unhappy about the conduct of an MP in any way um, should, should make their concerns known and then they can be properly considered. Do you think Jess Phillips is racist? Uh, that's No, I don't. Um, but uh, I think it's important that if people have concerns, if they're unhappy about the conduct of a Member of Parliament, that can be investigated as part of that process. And just on the wider point as well, um, it feels like Catherine Burblesing feels that she is being, I guess, penalised or used as a bit of a lightning rod because she's not doesn't have a left-wing view of the world and that many people in the teaching profession and in leadership roles in teaching I guess she would say do. Do you think there's any truth in that? When I visit schools the length and breadth of the country, what I find are dedicated people who are focused on making sure children get a great start in life. Very rarely will the conversation drift into, into politics. What people come into teaching to do and what people, uh, you know, when they become school leaders are focused on as well, is delivering really high quality educations. And that's, that's as it should be. Would you like to visit the school that she runs? I love, I visit schools everywhere. I'm always open to invitations to visit schools right across the country. It's the best part of the job. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, well, that was Bridget Phillipson for Labour. You're watching Safety Ridge on Sunday this morning. Uh, lots of policy discussion there uh, with both Labour and the Conservatives. And still to come on the programme this morning, it is this lady, it is uh, Dr Mary Boosted from the Education Union, the National Education Union. Lots to talk to her about, uh, about teachers' pay, about strikes and about schools as well. Plus, a bit later, we're going to hear from the Green Businessman who funds Just Stop Oil and gives a lot of money to Labour too. That is Dale Vince. Plus, we'll get some immediate reaction from our deputy political editor, Sam Copes, who's watching all of our interviews. We'll speak to Sam on the show a little bit later for his take. Well, the issue of public sector pay is clearly still high on the agenda for the government. And there is talk that Rishi Sunak could reject the recommendations of the pay review bodies for this year's settlement. As we've been hearing this morning, that could make matters worse in both health and education. Well, teachers are going on strike again later this month. We can now speak to the General Secretary of the biggest union, the NEU, and that is Dr Mary Balstead. Thank you very much for being on the programme Thank this you. morning. Um, I want to talk about strikes, um, but just before I do, we've got this new Labour announcement of a retention payment uh, for 2,400 for two years uh, for teachers. Do you think that's a good policy? I think that's a good start, yes. Um, I mean, obviously, I'm a teachers' union leader, so any extra money for teachers is a good idea. Uh, the problem with bursaries, which is the money that um, trainee teachers get while they're training, is that that doesn't... There's no requirement for them to stay in the profession. So a two-year incentive is a good idea. It's a start. Of course, we would want Labour to go much further. We want better salaries for the experienced teachers as well. I mean, there is a... This, the government at the moment is sort of money... moving money towards paying new teachers more. But the problem we have also is experienced teachers are leaving the profession in droves. 40,000 experienced teachers left the profession last year. That's 9% of uh, teachers, all the teachers. 8% of head teachers left last year. Is experience that we're missing in the profession. And so, yes, we need to pay beginning teachers more, but we need to also significantly raise salaries for all teachers. I did specifically ask about pay for experienced teachers um, and didn't get anything from Bridget Phillipson. She also didn't say that they would commit to the recommendation of the pay review body for a 6.5% rise for teachers. Is that concerning to you? Well, she said, it, I was watching outside, she said it would be a starting point and we hope that what Labour mean by that is, yes, that is a starting point and they would accept it, but... Don't you think she meant the opposite, that it was a starting point for the teaching side and then... I didn't see the interview. I would be surprised if that was the case. But the issue is we're not negotiating with Labour. Mm. I can't really speculate on what Labour would do because at the moment our dispute is with the current government, the Conservative government, who have... Um, Rishi Sunak and Jeremy Hunt and uh, Gillian Keegan have, over the course of the last two months in Parliament, proudly proclaimed that they are leaving uh, the... They are now leaving it up to the independent pay review body. We've had Rishi Sunak in Prime Minister's questions saying, um, we've always implemented 
the pay review body. Now, we understand that the pay review body has understood that the crisis in teacher supply is now so bad that they are go they've gone beyond the government, what the government says that they want to pay teachers and recommended 6.5%. And so, as they've exercised their independence, which the government has been lauding for months, now the government is saying something different, which is, we'll consider it in the round. Now, actually, they could have said that during the past few months. They could have said, we're leaving it to the independent pay review body, and we will get their recommendations, we'll consider them. That is not the impression that they've given at all. Is it because, in the last few weeks, it's become clear that the economic situation is worse than most people were expecting. Um, the governor of the Bank of England, for example, Andrew Bailey, telling Ed Conway from Sky a couple of weeks ago that the UK cannot continue to have the current level of wage rises because they're inflationary. Is that, do, you think, do you have any sympathy with that argument at all? No, I have no sympathy with that argument at all. Um, the OECD reported last week that it, it is private sector profits which are driving inflation. Uh, not Partly. Not entirely. N the majority. That the, 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 the part of the increase yeah. is private sector profits, but I think uh, it is acknowledged by the Bank of England and others that pay comes into it. Well, public sector pay doesn't produce a, way, a price hike at the points of use. Consumers, if they're using state education, don't pay per lesson. Uh, consumers don't, if they're using the National Health Service, pay per time they go. It doesn't feed into cost price rises in the same way that you could argue excessive pay rises in the private sector, although we haven't seen those, feeds into the prices people pay. And the consequences of not paying public sector workers is that they are leaving public service and the services which they provide are collapsing. You have to invest. There's no evidence that public sector pay fees into inflation. That's just becoming an argument which the government is now using in another attempt Well, that's what the Bank bamboozle. of England say as well, right? Well, Not just the government. Uh, you know, you, the Bank, you the Bank of England but... governor on half a million a year can say, he, he's quite at liberty to say that um, uh, teachers who earn on average less than £40,000 a year shouldn't get a pay rise. I'm not going to take lessons from him. Now, the NEU is striking again, uh, 5th and 7th of July. We've already had uh, multiple days of strikes this year. How long are you prepared to keep striking for? Well, we don't want to go on strike. And what I want to do on this programme is apologise to parents and, you know, to say that the last thing that teachers want to do is lose two more days' wages. They're not being paid enough as it is and to disrupt their children's education any further. But, you know, we are at a crisis point. I've given you the number of teachers leaving the profession. That's bad enough. They're leaving. This year, the government is going to miss its secondary training place numbers by 50%, over 50%. We have a million children being taught in classes of over 30. We have the highest class sizes amongst the highest in the developed world, alongside Brazil, Colombia and Mexico, our class sizes. We have children routinely being taught by teachers who are not teaching in the subject area that they even have a, an A-level in. We, you... have a, we have a staffing crisis in our schools. There is a crisis every day in our schools. And if you don't meet the Secretary of State for Education for months when you're in dispute, how else are we meant to... How else are my members el else meant to say we can't carry on like this anymore? Are children still getting a good education? Do you have confidence the, the, in that? The, the, the children are getting the very best education that teachers can give them. Teachers work the most unpaid overtime of any profession. Okay. Working weeks of 55 hours and over. But how much better could we do if education was funded properly and if there were enough teachers and head teachers to teach and lead schools? Uh, just before, while I've got you, there's one other story that I would like to get your view on. Uh, it's this row between Catherine Burble Singh, who is a head teacher of a school I in London, and Jess Phillips, who she's accused of racism. She said she subscribes to the idea that black and Asian individuals in public life owe a duty to voice opinions that match with the left wing view of the world. Now, this is a genuine question. Um, I just think that some of our viewers would say that they have an impression that teaching unions are of the left and that there's a lot of people in teaching who are of the left. Do you think there is an acceptance of teachers who have views that are politically from the right? Uh, yes, I do think. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I taught for a long time in schools and you meet teachers of every political persuasion and none. 
although I have to say that politics isn't something that's routinely discussed sure. in staff rooms, it's mm -hmm. usually your lesson and what's happened and things like that. Yes, I think, and I think that teachers of the right have had a very, very strong influence on government policy. They're the ones which are routinely brought in to be part of the focus groups and the discussion groups and the advisory groups. Um, you know, so, yeah, I mean, my union isn't politically affiliated. Uh, we go to the Labour Party, the Lib Dems, the Greens. We go, we're the only union that goes to and has a stand at the Conservative Party. We try to engage with all parties. So, yes, I think there is an acceptance. I don't think there is any... I, it, rather, the reverse in terms of government policy, that uh, teachers with right-wing political views have had a disproportionate influence on government over the last 12 years. And teachers, are, you know, who are... Uh, centre ground or of the left who are saying sensible things have just been dismissed as the blob. Do you um, have sympathy for Catherine Burblesing in this row she's, that she's having? Well, I, d I actually wasn't aware of this row, so I'd need to... Okay, fair I'd need to, I, <laughs> Go I and have a look. To, I don't want to um, say anything uh, particular because I'm not, I'm not aware of that, but on a general point, it's certainly not the case that teachers with right-wing views have been ignored by this government. Sure. Thank you very much. But we're, we're really good having the studio this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Well, as usual, uh, the tape will follow this programme just after 9.30. That's our chance to analyse today's interviews, talk through some news lines with our deputy political editor, uh, Sam Coates. But we can get a little take from Sam just now, uh, a bit of a taster, if you like, on what stood out to him this morning. Uh, Sam, anything in particular that's caught your eye? Well, it's quite refreshing, Sophie, for the first time, maybe since 2016, that the words Boris and Johnson haven't been mentioned by this point on the show. And there we go. I've just got to jinx that. But when you overturn the rock that's uh, labelled policy, some you find some incredibly odd things, and you've done it with health and education on the show this morning, and you, you find politicians essentially behaving in ways that you wouldn't expect. So you've got a Conservative Party that's spending big money, billions of pounds, for instance, on that NHS workforce plan, £2.4 billion. And as you effectively got Steve Barclay to admit in not so many words, that is coming from the Treasury, that is coming from borrowing. So big borrowing by the Tory party in order to fund their plans, but many, many challenges on public services ahead. On the Labour Party, um, they won't accept the independent body, uh, necessarily the pay review body's recommendation when it comes to teachers. Uh, and very little detail from the Secretary, Shadow Secretary of State for Education, Bridget Phillipson. Just one concrete plan uh, uh, across all of the interview that she was able to talk about. That's breakfast clubs. Uh, for people, for kids from nine months to 11 years. N nothing else was she willing to commit. Maybe we'll get uh, a bit more when Keir Starmer gives his speech on opportunity later this week. But it strikes me overall, Sophie, neither party doing anything like what they need to do on policy when we're only a little more than a year out from a general election. Big, big challenges, a long way to go. That's what's making politics quite unpredictable at the moment in the face of lots of problems. Uh, certainly uh, is Sam, and I definitely share that uh, that Sam was saying. I wasn't sure if we weren't getting more uh, on the childcare policy because they're about to announce it, or because there's something going on behind the scenes that means they're still thrashing it out. More from Sam uh, at 9:30. Now, Sky News's Westminster Accounts project was a big step forward in providing transparency around the funding of our politics, and the businessman and green campaigner Del Vince has donated 1.5 million pounds to Labour after the last 10 years. Nothing wrong with that, of course, but there's been more controversy given he also funds the campaign group Just Stop Oil. Now, I sat down with Del Vince earlier this week. Now, I feel like there's been an awful lot said about you. One headline, who is Del Vince, the hippie turned eco-tycoon funding the green zealots? So how would you describe yourself? Uh, <clears throat> I'm definitely a hippie or an ex-hippie. I don't think I'm... Uh... Uh, I'm a funder of zealots or a zealot myself, which I've also been called. I've been called many, many things, actually. And, and I think, you know, it, I, don't, I don't give it much attention. I'm uh, first and foremost an environmentalist. Uh, I care passionately about the, uh, the unsustainability of the world uh, that we live in. And I've spent the last three decades pioneering a number of different approaches to the green economy in energy and in, in transport, in food, in football, in diamonds, all kinds of stuff to try and bring about a, uh, a Green Britain. My, all of my work, all of my focus on the creation of a Green Britain. Mm. There's been, I guess, more scrutiny about where you've been giving your money, right? Um, £1.5 million to the Labour Party over the last 10 years, as revealed by Sky News back in January, and also, of course, money to Just Stop Oil. Is that a problem? For me? No. 
for other people, perhaps they're saying, I guess, I guess what other, other people might say, right, is, look, people don't just give hundreds of thousands of pounds of their own money for no reason. What is the reason for you giving the donations? To who? Because, I mean, I also give money to Greenpeace, to mm. Sea Shepherd, to a women's refuge, to school breakfast clubs, to food banks. You know, the list goes on. To the Labour Party. To the Labour Party. Uh, the reason I do that is because I want them to win the next election. Mm -hmm. And there's always a funding gap between Labour and the Tories, a very big funding gap, and I try to do what I can to close that gap. Is it about influence as well? No, never. And I, I'm always very clear with them, I don't want anything. And they're always very clear with me, there's nothing on offer anyway. Do you think that at the back of their minds, if you take in £1.5 million, pounds, that there may be an influence question there? For them? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. I think the question is really surfaced by the right-wing media. It was a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's been going on for 10 years, right, funding of the Labour Party. But if you look at funding of the Conservative Party, you know, that's a completely different mm -hmm. uh, story. There's a lot of opaqueness, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you won't find a, a funder of the Tory party willing to come and talk to you about how much mm -hmm. they've given or why they've given it. So you welcome the scrutiny then? I've got no problem with it. Mm -hmm. I, I don't mind it at all. I, Obviously, I don't welcome the implications that come with it. There's mm. some kind of deal going on behind, you know, closed doors, that kind of stuff. You know, the idea that um, my donations caused Keir Starmer to come out with the North Sea policy that he has, when in fact uh, he announced that uh, a year ago in um, Davos, mm. and uh, and yet two weeks ago the right-wing press are like, oh, there's, you know, there's just one and a half million over the last ten years. Keir Starmer's got this new policy, which wasn't new, and, um, you know, tried to join those dots and say there's something going on. It's, it's not fun, um, but, uh, you know, it's how they roll, and, uh, and, and I don't mind. I mean, Rishi Sunak, for example, recently said, you know, it does appear that those eco-zealots at Just Stop Oil are writing Keir Starmer's energy policy, not content with disrupting our summer and cherished sporting events, they're essentially leading us into an energy surrender. That's a Prime Minister's view. <laughs> and I think he said that was in it when he was in Washington and you think he had better things to do. That's what I thought anyway. And there's nothing original in that from Rishi Sunak. He has no mandate to drill in the North Sea for oil and gas. He actually has no mandate at all from the British people. He should call an election. Do you talk to Keir Starmer and Ed Miliband, for example, about policy? I've known Ed Miliband since he was leader of the Labour Party, so for some time, and we've talked occasionally, and I've talked to Keir Starmer twice. Mm. And what, what did you say in those conversations? Well, the last one, as I told the, uh, the listeners of the Today programme, was a five-minute phone call in which he thanked me for donations. And uh, the next day, the Sun ran a headline that said, secret meeting unveiled. I told six million people that I'd had a phone call. Mm. And that's what the Sun called it. This is, the, this is what we're dealing with. Mm. Um, it's interesting looking at Labour's um, policy on green energy, right, because it is getting an awful lot of attention at the minute. So this is their green prosperity plan, £28 billion a year to fund investment in the green economy. Now, Labour is talking about delaying uh, reaching that £28 billion because of the economic situation. Do you think that's the right call? Well, first, I want to say... Labour are getting a lot of scrutiny across the board. Mm -hmm. the Which is right, because they might form the next government. Right? It looks very likely, doesn't mm -hmm. it? And I think this is what's causing some of the hysterical approaches of the right-wing media in terms of funding so and what, that kind of so, stuff. But, but, but what's that? Yeah, I, I, look, yeah. it's an interesting point to make. But what's your view on the delay to the green gotcha. prosperity? I think it's not a problem. I think it's a very sensible thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, uh, obviously, we're in difficult economic circumstances, and there still could be a year or a year and a half before the election. We don't know how much worse the Tories will make it before the election. So it makes sense to say we may not go at this completely in the first year, the 28 billion, yeah. and it may take a year or two to, to reach that number. That's what I heard Rachel Reeves say, and I think it just makes perfect sense. Do you think, um, you know, there might be other people in the Shadow Cabinet who look at that funding, right? £28 billion pounds a year, that's a lot, and think, hang on a minute, we've got schools, we've got hospitals that could really do with that money. Why are we spending that amount mm. on one issue? The thing about the green economy is it's a good investment for our country. That well, so is education, right? So is the hospitals that are saving people's lives. Yes, and fossil fuels are not. For example, uh, for every billion pounds we invest in fossil fuels versus renewable energy, we can get twice as many jobs from renewable energy and almost twice as much GDP growth from that investment. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of what we need to do to get to uh, a green economy doesn't require money at all. Mm -hmm. So would you like to see Labour be a bit more radical on green issues then? Uh, no, I'm happy with where they are. Um, you know, it's not for me to say. You know, I have my own opinion about stuff. Um, I think, uh, you know, if they become the government, I think they'll be the greenest government we've ever seen in our country. And for me, that's enough because uh, I also believe that they understand the green economy, the environment issues, um, and um, 
They'll do the right things. If you look at what the Conservatives are doing, they're drilling for oil and gas in the teeth of a climate crisis, claiming it will lower energy bills, <coughs> excuse me, when it can't, because we allow international markets to set the price of the fossil fuels we make here. We pay 10 times more for our North Sea gas in the energy crisis than, than, than we used to, for no, for no good reason. They also claim it will give us energy security, but we can't get new oil and gas out for four years if we start today. And after 20 years, it's all gone. There's no security in something that's here today, gone tomorrow. Look, you, you are passionate, right, about um, North Sea oil and gas. You can see that. There'll be other people listening to this who think, look, if you're wealthy, it's easy to be perfect when it comes to green energy, right? It's easy to drive electric cars. It's easy to make the case for green levies on energy bills. But I guess for many people who might not be as well off, they feel, think that the priority right now should be all about the cost of living. It should be helping people feed their families, making sure that people aren't going to lose their homes. Mm -hmm. Is right now the time to be talking about these issues? I think that it is, actually. And I don't support green levies on energy bills. They never should have been there in the first place. They should be paid for centrally, not because it... But that's still people's money, though, isn't it? You say pay for centrally, that's still people's money. It's not like magic money tree, right? No, it's, people no. are still paying taxes. No, but it's regressive when it's on energy bills because the, the, the poor among us pay the most proportionally uh, for their energy with green levies on. It shouldn't be paid for that way. Um, mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. And And... In terms of the cost of living crisis that we face, energy, our energy bills are a big part of that. If we transition to 100% green energy, and we're at nearly 50% electricity on the grid now already, by the way, if we make that complete transition, we can have permanently low energy bills, we can eradicate fuel poverty, we can separate ourselves from global fossil fuel markets and be truly energy independent. And, uh, and in a great place, the economic benefit to our country is in excess of 50 billion pounds a year kept in our economy rather than shipped out to the rest of the world. Uh, now, I want to just finish by asking you a bit about Just Stop Oil. Um, I think we might be able to see uh, the latest uh, protest uh, by them. Uh, now, this was uh, disrupting the ashes. You can see there Johnny Bairstow <laughs> physically carrying off a Just Stop Oil protester. Oh. I mean, some people might like the police to take this approach when they're blocking roads, right? I think, I think you're right. I've heard that. What's your own view? Oh, I think it's, uh, it's comical. I think that, um, you know, much is being made of this in the news at the moment. And... Actually, it was a few minutes delay to the cricket. Um, whereas the UN estimate that so far the climate okay, crisis... OK, you've, you've, you've made your points on the climate change a lot. I just want, I'm just trying to stick to the just up oil just for now, if you may. It's, because... it's disruption. It's the point I want to make. A few minutes disruption. And the UN say 4 million people have already lost their lives and 20 million people every year are made homeless globally by the climate crisis. That's a few minutes of cricket. People are losing their homes and their lives. Is it, is it doing that cause any good? That's the question. That's the killer question, though, isn't it? Well, we don't know, do we, right? It's not the killer it's, question. Because, you know... It's the frequent question. And I think the frequent question. But I think that many people think, look, delaying the cricket or a bit of colourful powder at the snooker is one thing. Mm. But the disruption to roads where people might be trying to use ambulances to get to hospitals, where people are trying to... on zero-hours contracts and they're worried about making it to their place of work, mm. that's something else. Well, look, I was on a protest uh, around Parliament Square a few weeks ago and they have a fantastic process for allowing flashing blue lights through. It really works, and there were two while I was there. We protested for about an hour, then the police said, look, final warning. They're, they've got a protocol for that. The protesters understand when the police say final warning, they get off the streets unless they want to be arrested. Four people did that day. It's, it's not as bad as it sounds. Central London traffic isn't very fast anyway, and it's a temporary delay. It's here today, gone tomorrow. The disruption... Do you have any sympathy causing. for those drivers? You know, the ones who you see getting out their car, pleading yes, of course I with do. protesters? Of course I do, but I have sympathy for the four million people that have died already, the 20 million displaced, they're made homeless every year already, and the more that is to come for my children and my grandchildren as well, and yours. OK. Um, final question. Do you have any vices when it comes to, you know, the, <laughs> the green agenda? Do you, like, you can't give up your flight or, you, you, you know, you have sausages once a week or something? Have what once a week? Sausages once a week. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> um, do I have vices? No. Uh... I like to sit around a, uh, an open fire sometimes outdoors, an outdoor fire, burning some wood. But, uh, but I don't fly, uh, I don't eat animals, um, you know. I mean, I'm not saying I'm perfect, but do I have advice? I like chips, but I don't think that's an environment advice. I just like chips. <laughs> that's a very fair advice to have. Thank you very much. <laughs> Dietary vices rather than environmental uh, vices for uh, Dale Vince there. Uh, now, the final interview that we've got for you on the programme is something a bit different, because in the last 10 years, we've had five prime ministers 
it's extraordinary, uh, and some of the most dramatic political times for a generation and more. And that's meant some pretty extraordinary images of the PM from Downing Street and beyond. Now, Andrew Parsons has captured many of those images as the official number 10 photographer under David Cameron, Theresa May, Boris Johnson, Liz Truss, and he, he wasn't for the current resident, but he did take pictures of him as Chancellor, Rishi Sunak. Now, I spoke to Andrew recently, and he brought along some never-before images to show us. I'm quite excited about this interview because I feel like you've had access to more prime ministers in a more intimate way, possibly, than anyone I've ever interviewed, if you think about it, right? Yeah, no, that's right. I was the first one uh, to go into number 10 as the, as the official photographer. Um, and with that, I then stayed on to do four. So uh, Cameron, May, Boris and Liz Truss, yeah. So there is no one else that's photographed it or documented it um, for that period of time. Um, and now it's... The, the, it, now it's happened. They've continued on with the uh, with the photographers that are there today. So it's good. It's all set and up. You had a lot of access. I mean, were yeah, there times I was very when lucky, you were yeah. ordered out of the room, or uh, I could probably count on one hand when I was asked to leave the room, and it was either uh, one because there was uh, spies that had come in from MI5 or six or whatever, obviously so for obvious reasons. Um, two when when they phoned the queen because we obviously weren't allowed in there or three or uh, if they had a private issue that they wanted to sort out at the time you know they, they do have their own lives that they need to sort out as well so yeah. but i would say definitely on one hand um that i was asked to leave and i was very lucky i mean it was it was a fantastic opportunity where i had free reign to go um in all the meetings whether it was the covid meetings brexit meetings uh, and towards the end obviously all the ukraine uh, meetings that were being held the majority of the time, in secure, tight, secure rooms with only very few of us in there that perhaps would know that was coming down the track. If you had to pick out like one pinch yourself moment when you were like, I actually can't believe this is happening. Um, yeah, it's a question that's asked quite a lot. There's, there's, a, there's a couple of them ones really. The first time I ever thought that was when Cameron left and uh, Theresa May took over because what happens is you, they, they're clapped out uh, you do the pictures, there's quite a lot of emotion going around with the staff because, they, you know, they've been working for the Prime Minister for so long. So there's a few tears, clapping him out. The family are usually with him, him and his children. He goes out and then 30 minutes later, Theresa May comes in Bruce. and they're clapping her in and it's all of a sudden the, the expressions have changed and it's smiling. And like you say, it is pretty brutal. And as for my role, I can't at all get attached to it. You just have to keep on going, stay focused and... And then you start again, you're in with the new one, the, the uh, Theresa May starts and then the reshuffle starts and it all happens in one day. You start the day with, say, David Cameron at eight o'clock doing his briefing. By the evening, um, Theresa May is forming her ga uh, cabinet. And at that point, I did think, gosh, it can't get any, any better than this in the sense of historic moments. But then um, the last year or so has been pretty turbulent and, and, and every day was different. Every day it was just off, it was off diary and things were happening and flying around. And you, yeah, it, yeah, the last three days of when Boris resigned was, was quite tough. Yeah, I, it's interesting hearing you because I kind of feel, I didn't get the same access, but out on Downing Street and you, you, you start off with one person at the lectern and then a couple of hours later it's still someone else. You're like, what's going on? It was truly amazing, yeah. 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 Um, let's, let's talk through some of the moments. I want to use some of the photos uh, that you've taken to do it as well. Um, here you go. Call me it, Dave, remember yeah, him? Exactly, yeah, I do. Yeah, this was a very, very old one on Pancake Day over <laughs> at his house in uh, West London where he decided to make us all pancakes. And um, purely, he, he quite often is that, he was quite... He was, quite good at, on the stove. He would quite often cook of random things if we were all around there doing stuff. And this was just one of those moments where he goes, right, it's pancake day, everyone. And, um, and, and away he went sort of thing. Um, the, you told me when we, we spoke before the interview that you were there for the coalition talks between the Lib Dems yeah, that's right. and the Conservatives, yeah. which I'm kind of fascinated by. How was that? So that was 2010 and we were over in Portcullis House then. And, um, there was, it was very stop, start, stop, start, stop, start. Oh, it's coming close, it's coming close. And then there was a lot of, um, a lot of pizzas being delivered, ordered in the middle of the night and stuff like that. Do they that, get on as well as they seem to, David Cameron and Nick Clegg? Or? Uh, from the, from the, uh, the parts that I photographed, especially in that coalition and into the early years of, of number 10, then, yeah, they were, they were very good. I remember um, the first time that David Cameron and Nick Clegg walked into the um, cabinet room together and... Um, and David Cameron did say to, to Nick Clegg, we're going to do some amazing things in this room. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they both smiled in, a, in an agreement of, yeah. um, yes, we've made it, let's make it work sort of thing. 
And then you went from David Cameron to Theresa May. I mean, I can't really imagine, you know, greater sort of personality contrast than uh, these two. Here she is um, doing her paperwork, studious. That's right. We were on the flights there because usually what happens is that um, when the Prime Minister gets in, they then go and tour Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. And this was one of those days, I remember. I think we were on our way to see Nicola Sturgeon, if I remember rightly. Um, and uh, and Theresa, Theresa was lovely to work for. And, and in some ways, um, you knew where you were. Um, she had a lovely personality and, and was there to get on with the job rather than worry about anything else that what, what we were doing and things like that. So a lot of stuff with Theresa was at work, very natural. Um, as opposed to, I didn't, you know, as opposed to campaigning or yeah. doing odd be beats. Or... I, I interviewed Theresa May quite a few times, and I've always found her, like you say, like very diligent. But she, she didn't do small talk at all. Was she like that with you behind the scenes? Or uh, not? I mean, every now and again, yes. Not, not so much, but every now and again, the, it, it, you have to spend a, a lot of time with them to have the small talk. If it's if it's small episodes such as going to Scotland and back. The days are so busy that there's not much um, small talk to be had. It's usually on the foreign trips, the yeah. summits, or the, yeah. um, uh, you know, or, or the various other sort of leader trips that you'd go and yeah. see. Um, she she would have a laugh with you. Yeah, she would have a joke with you. There was one picture I took of her where she's she's um, she's making everyone laugh when she's leaning on a photocopier, um, and she would come out with little one-liners that would make people laugh, and it would just be that that moment of surprise that she would give to everyone because it wasn't expected. Yeah, yeah. that just made her just. Um, relax and yeah. things like that. Um, there's another classic one where she used to do the morning rounds, as you know of, at conference. Yeah. And um, she's in, a, in the studio being interviewed for, for a radio station. And, and there's a picture of her and everyone's in stitches um, because she'd been, she said something very sarky to, um, to, to, the, to the interview uh, the journalist at the time. Um, and, it, and you yeah. had to be on your guard with it. With the others, you expected it. With, with Theresa May, it was yeah. so limited that when it did happen, it was very funny, yeah. And then, obviously, Boris Johnson. <laughs> Mr. Yeah. Joker, a uh, very different um, person. Like, here you go, he's on a plane. This kind of feels like a classic Boris Johnson picture. Yeah, that's right. That's when we were, um, we were doing a tour off to uh, some military bases, I think, to go and see the Ukraine uh, soldiers being trained by the Brits. And uh, they just said, you know, that he was tied on, obviously, and, and, and said, you know, he was offered a seat at the back to have a look, and at which point he did. I think at which point he'd resigned by then, anyway. Um, and he was just waiting for the period um, for, the, for the new one to take over. So it would have been between the July and September of that year. Um, but this wasn't him doing a trick. He just went to have a look and you'd go and join him. But he would have no qualms about you going to join him on, on the back there. He wouldn't think it was unusual, like, mm. why are you taking a picture? Mm. He would actually sort of understand what we did, you know? Uh, I want to talk then... about this picture because this is the moment that Boris Johnson read... Rishi Sunak's resignation letter. Is that it's right? pretty much in that moment, yeah. It's around that sequence. And this has never been seen before. Um, not, not on the, not on television. I don't think. No, no, no. Exactly. So, like, this is the moment where I think this is where he's starting to say, right, we can, we can still do this. Yeah. How, how, how did he react? Because you know, for many people, they thought this is the moment the game's up, right? His chance has gone. Um, well, when you're in the room. Um, you're not really focused too much on what's being said and what's going on because you're you're waiting for the moment to happen. But Boris always came back, always, always. Even when he, he was down and out, he always came back. And um, one thing I would say about him and, and David Cameron that when things were were, were um, what seemed to be sort of down and not and, and not on his side, they sort of relished on the fight and mm. it was gave them more energy if let nothing less, you know. And they and they therefore took that and they sort of. As I guess you could say, got the ball and run with it a lot of the time. It's very rare that I'd see him down and out. Yeah. What, what were the times that you did see him down and out? Um, or oh, I'd have to write those on a postcard and send them to you. I can't remember. I mean, is this is this one of them? He looks pretty down and out here. No, I think this is just him having a serious conversation on on his last day in office. Yeah. And this is the last day in office. He's there with Simon Case, of course, yeah, another person yeah. who's been in the headlines an awful lot recently, yeah. the head of the civil service. Um, and watching... And, and watching re people getting ready for him to deliver his speech, yeah. How was he on this day? Um, surprisingly well, actually. I, I, I was quite surprised. I thought there would be a bit more downbeat about it. I mean, don't get me wrong, no-one was rolling around laughing, but it was business as usual, and this is what we've got to do, and this is where we are at, and, you know, this is... What's happened? Would it surprise is, you if you went for another run at it then? If you came back or...? I don't know. I mean, I thought what was quite 
telling the other day was when there was pictures of him leaving his house in his old car. Uh, obviously, the dog was, was in the front and he was waving and things like that. I, and I looked at those pictures and it reminded me so much of the old days of when he was mayor and he was out campaigning. Mm. And it was like, um, one, I was surprised he was driving because usually the cops are um, driving him around and stuff. Um, but that's Boris, he wanted to do it, so he obviously mm. wants to do it. But it just reminded me so much of, of, of the old days. Mm. Of that's like, interesting. It ju just the picture alone, you know, the moving footage mm. of like the photographers and the film crews around him. And, but he wasn't phased by it, window down, waving. It's, it's, all, it's no problem, gang, don't worry, we're just on our way out to, you know, go out for lunch or whatever. And it, it, it just had that element of... Yeah, made you think. It, 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 yeah, I paused for a minute thinking, yeah. oh, interesting, it, it's, it's like the old days. Yeah. And let's see where Here that... Here we go again. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, this is a very different image, obviously. This is during COVID. Yes, exactly. And um, it was tough, um, COVID, for everyone, obviously, for obvious reasons. And, um, but inside, inside work, it was... Uh, news was filtering through all the time of what was going on and, and this would have been one of those moments where news was sort of breaking that, um, you know, uh, whatever trouble was, was happening around the country at the time. Um, you know, and he worked hard at it. You know, everyone was in there for, for long times at periods of day because it was such a, a moving, moving issue. And you obviously famously took a lot of the pictures that were used as evidence in Partygate, right? in the inquiry. I don't know if you can give us any sense about what was actually going on in Number 10 at that time. Well, I, I wasn't partial. I was only um, partial to that, the one in the cabinet room. So it's not, you know, I, I was asked by the inquiry to hand over those images of, um, of the cabinet room, which is what I did. So from the rest of it, you know, yeah. it, it's difficult for you yeah. to comment if, you know. Didn't have the official photographer there. For exactly, them, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. that makes so. sense, um, definitely. Um, let's have a little look at, uh, I think we've got Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak, uh, or Rishi Sunak, because I'm quite interested in the relationship between the two men. You obviously saw them, you didn't work for Rishi Sunak, but you saw him working uh, for Boris Johnson as Chancellor. Did they get on? What, what was it like? Yeah, yeah, they did get on. Um, and there's pictures of them together getting on very well indeed, you know, um, when they've been appointed and, and at conferences. Um, and in meetings, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, this one was just taken uh, at conference, uh, where he's preparing to do his conference speech um, as, ch as Chancellor, I believe. Um, and he was... Um, and, and I still do bits and pieces with, with him today in, in, on the political front, but... Um, and he's, he's easy, easy to photograph. Uh, that's a totally natural picture. I, in fact, I think I'm sort of knelt down by a chair, so it's not like I'm standing up and he's apparent that I'm... Does he try and make room. himself look taller in pictures? I'm just interested in you I have down never on the chair. Witnessed, I've never witnessed... Um, I only do that because I, I tend... That's the angles I tend to like, okay. you know, to Very nicely, of, <laughs> but I'm fine, OK. <laughs> so you get, you get, you I get what you. I'm saying, yeah. No, <laughs> I've never seen any evidence of any props being used to, okay. to make anyone in politics taller. OK. I, I tell a lie, Ruth Davidson did it once when we were in... Uh, in, uh, in Scotland with her and David Cameron, she stood on a car battery, I think. Oh, there you go. Which she, uh, which she WhatsApped me the picture <laughs> of the other day. <laughs> um, and then you also worked for Liz Truss, of course. Yeah. For a brief period. Um, there she is, preparing to resign, I think that is. Or... No, that was when the Chancellor resigned. Oh, when she sacked Kwasi Kwasi, which must have been mm. a difficult day for her. How, how was she on that day? Um, I mean, it's my job is to blend in and just to just to document what's in front of in front of me. It's not for me to to judge how they are, or how they're not. There's yeah. there's so much going on. They've got so much, um, so many other issues. Um, as you can see, that was like minutes to spare. As you can see by the headline um, on the television there, I think she was due on at two thirty. It's two it's two twenty nine. Um, it's you know it's, these are tense moments, and you're there to document these tense moments, not there to. I'm definitely not there to judge the moments because um, with the situations that I've been in, um, I'd spend my life being a judge. I'm a judge in the moments, you know. Yeah. You, you, you pretty much blend in, you get on with it. It's been extraordinary looking at the pictures to realise what a roller coaster period you yeah. have done this over. Um, those pictures of David Cameron feel like they're from another world, and then you look at stuff like this and you're like, wow, this was so intense at the time. Yeah. Do you feel that the experience that you've had has given you more or less confidence in the way our country's run? Ah, uh, now you're talking politics, though. 
<laughs> uh, that's a different thing. That's a different thing. Um, that you know, I'm not here to. I'm not here to comment about how the con country okay. is run and how it's not run. Thanks very much for being on the program. It's been really no interesting to get your no insight worries. and to look at some of the images as well. Extraordinary. Brilliant. Bit of a different uh, interview there with Andrew Parsons, one of these guys who really has had a front row seat uh, in history. It's extraordinary to think about the different prime ministers uh, the, that he has had that kind of access to. Uh, we're going to go straight into the take. No break for us uh, this morning because it's been such a busy show. So we can bring in uh, Sam Coates, our deputy political editor, uh, who's standing by watching the programme uh, for us. And um, Sam, I was looking forward to interviewing Andrew Parsons because if you think about it, it's extraordinary the amount of access that he has had, the things he's seen over the last few years. And I guess also it's a bit of a reminder about what an extraordinary period of political history we've lived through. Oh, God, yes. I, that was absolutely riveting. I, I have to confess, I was kind of squinting at the monitor in front of me to try and get uh, as big an eyeful of those amazing pictures of moments of history and hear him talk about it. And... Uh, you are grateful that there is someone in the room at, at moments like that, perhaps in, in, in periods in the past there haven't been people recording that. But, Sophie, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't be telling the truth if I didn't say I was also slightly uncomfortable. I think that there is no question Andrew Parsons is a fantastic photographer and a, and a, and a guy with enormous integrity, and you, and you saw that. But... In the role that he's performing, he is not doing it as a journalist. He is employed variously. At one point, David Cameron tried to employ him as a civil servant. That role is funded frequently by the Conservative Party. These are not fair... Th these are fair uh, photographs, but they are not a full representation uh, of the range of scenes that we could have looked at at those moments. Um, and I think y y y the important thing to say is the way this works is you will never get a picture that the principal, that the Prime Minister doesn't want out there uh, uh, if the official photographer is taking the pictures. If you get a journalist taking the picture, a uh, news photographer, somebody from the Press Association uh, who is in the room uh, and uses their own judgment, their editorial judgment and their editorial selection uh, as to what pictures uh, that you get put out. You get a far bigger range uh, and moments are caught that you wouldn't necessarily want if you're Prime Minister, but that's the price of having an independent person in the room. That job is not independent. The pictures that are put out are ones that make the principles look good. And so, ultimately, the proliferation of people who do roles like uh, the one that Andy does, and there are successors to him in, in Downing Street today, they are uh, civil servants now, um, it d does make me uncomfortable because very often the pictures that you get on the front page of newspapers, and yes, the pictures that you uh, you get on Sky News, and we, we label them quite clearly as coming from number 10, do not represent the full selection of images that you could have had and would have had if you had a journalist, somebody working as a journalist in the room, rather than, and it's a disobliging term, but I'm going to use it, a vanity photographer. I and mean, this is the wider point, isn't it, Sam, about the proliferation, as you say, of different outlets that politicians can use unedited to get their uh, views out, to get their information out, whether that is videos that are constructed within number 10 or number 11, whether that's, as you say, photographers who are employed uh, by uh, those in government. Uh, it, it's definitely you know, a big issue. Um, let's talk a little bit about the think stories of the day, shall we? Um, because we had Steve Barclay, the House Secretary, uh, on. And I feel like it's getting to that point now where we're starting to look very, very closely at Rishi Sunak's five targets. Now, if you remember, these were the five pledges that he made at the beginning of the year. He was very, very clear this is what he wanted to be judged on. At the time, people thought that it was pretty low-hanging fruit. But I did have to ask uh, the House Secretary whether the government's plans were working. These were tough targets that he set himself, and rightly so. Well, most people take... thought they were easy, that they were low bars. Well, you can now see that there were tough targets that were set, and it was right that we did so. And if you take waiting lists, the plan is working. We cleared the longest waits, the two-year waits the last summer. The plan is working on waiting we cleared, lists. We cleared the longest waits. Well, what the plan set out was the target the longest waits. We cleared the two-year waits last summer. We cleared over 90% of the 18-month waits. We're now focused on the 65-week waits. That's the next element of the plan. 
Uh, there you go. That was uh, Steve Barkley there talking about those uh, targets. We can bring Sam uh, back in at this point. It's difficult for them, isn't it? Because, look, this is a Prime Minister who has pitched himself as someone who makes things happen, who, who can do things, get jobs done. And if he can't even get the job done when it comes to his five targets, then he really has got a problem. That's right. Look, there was a very straightforward plan. Year one, 2023, hit five targets, show that you can deliver. Year two, 2024, go into the election with a whole load of new promises and say, look, because I can deliver, because I've delivered on this, you can trust me to deliver on that. And none of it is working out in the way uh, that it wants. The um, scale of the industrial action is undoubtedly contributing to the problems with the waiting lists. Now, I, I have this feeling that back in December, January, nobody in number 10 totally appreciated where this row over pay uh, was going to lead. And so there were unforeseen consequences of the pay strategy that the government is now locked in and determined to double down on, not saying that they'll accept the pay uh, review body. But there's a mess. This is a skit fire across all the different bits of, uh, of, of those uh, pledges. Three of them are interlinked. They're to do with the economy. They're to do with inflation, growth and debt. But they're all linked in an unhelpful way, because if there's more growth, then there might be more inflation. So actually, the Bank of England is putting up rates to try and curb growth to bring down inflation, which will mean higher uh, debt than you otherwise would have got. So you've actually got three priorities of the five that are pulling in opposite directions. Uh, that's a horrible mess, a horrible mess. And there are a lot of Tories who are utterly miserable <laughs> when I saw them this week uh, just gone, scratching their heads as to just how they've ended up in this situation with the five tests. Now, there is still some way to go. Um, people looking at their energy bills will notice them coming down quite sharply, imminently, because of the reduction in the energy price cap. That'll feed through into inflation. Um, economists still talk about it coming down quite sharply in the autumn. So don't write everything off. It's important to say that. And we could, we could see some rapid economic improvement uh, in terms of inflation. But growth, you know, 0.1%, 0.2% growth at the moment, potential for a recession at the turn of the year because of the need for the Bank of England to raise interest rates higher than it, ha than it thought it was going to have to because inflation is worse uh, than anybody predicted. All of this is bad and difficult for Rishi Sunak and going to rebound on him politically. It certainly is. And of course, he said on Sky News that he takes personal responsibility if those targets aren't there. Um, we'll talk to Sam about the other interviews in a moment, but there's just one, one more um, pieces from the Steve Barkley interview that I did want to play you. And this is about the funding after how he's going to fund the NHS uh, workforce announcement. And the reason I wanted to do, to do this is because this was announced before this week. And I have to say, it's the one question that I haven't seen other people asking Steve Barkley. And I felt that, look, if it was Labour, I feel that there would be more scrutiny over how the policy was funded. Let's take a listen. It's 2.4 billion of additional funding. So, uh, that will be announced by the Chancellor in the usual way at the next fiscal event. So but it's additional funding to the department. So I haven't heard any you know, tax rises or spending cuts, so I'm assuming this sounds like it might be extra borrowing. 100% of GDP, that's the current level of debt. Interest rates rising, so the cost of service in government debt is going up. Is that really responsible? Well, it scales up, Sophie. So first year, obviously, you only have one year of people being trained. In the second year, that doubles as those billion. medical... If Labour, scales... if Labour announced a policy of 2.4 billion without saying how that money was coming from, you would be after them like a rocket. Okay. Well, let's bring some back in. I'm not sure that's an actual phrase, after them like a rocket. Um, Scott, my editor, was like, you mean a whippet, not a rocket, but you get the, you get the right idea. <laughs> Um, that's right. And, 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 but you've got the politics bang on. Of course, if Labour announced a £2.4 billion pound spending commitment, everyone's going to chase after them about how it's funded. Um, and we are just at that point in the cycle where I think the government just think they can, they can let this slip through and everyone will be grateful because it's an announcement of, of more funding in an environment where there's not very much money left. Um, but I think the, the big picture on spending is... It, it, it is actually very striking. It, 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 it's very grim, you know, in some senses for public services. Where the Tories think they need to be, Tory strategists, Tory advisers tell me that they think that by the time of the next election, they need to have, quotes, taken health and education off the table by having pr uh, promised to spend a huge amount on it and therefore shut down Labour's argument that they will 
fund it better. So that's what, where the Tories need to be. And it feels like we're miles away from the Tories being able to do that. On the Labour side, the number one priority for the Labour Party, and you see it in every interview, and you saw it in Bridget Phillipson's interview with you uh, 30 minutes ago, is to prove that Labour are the party of fiscal responsibility and the party that will not fritter away public money. So often refusing to commit to spending pledges, not saying uh, that there will be much money left, uh, much money in the bank uh, for public services once the election uh, is out of the way, if they if they win it. So we have a role reversal of the two main parties. It means that neither uh, main party is doing what you would traditionally uh, expect them uh, to do, but is also awkward uh, for both of the party leaders, Keir Starmer and Rishi Sunak, because their troops see them doing things uh, differently to perhaps how they would want. Well, let's bring in Bridget Phillipson, because I do think the interview uh, really does illustrate the point that Sam is making. Shadow Education Secretary Bridget Phillipson, uh, I was asking her about uh, the childcare offer and uh, the uh, breakfast club offer that the Labour Party have. That is normally what happens. Yes, that is normally what takes place. Um, what we're seeing at the moment is far from the normal kind of process. So when you've got a government that has received these reports, won't publish the reports, I think it is incredibly disrespectful. We're almost at the end of the summer term. School leaders want to plan on that basis. They don't know what their budgets are going to be. We need a different kind of relationship. It has to involve respecting teachers for what they're doing. That was obviously Bridget Phillipson talking about pay review bodies. Uh, another big of the, uh, which I guess I does make the point as well, because Labour don't want to commit to uh, too much money, as they would see it, for public sector workers because of those fiscal constraints Sam was talking about. This is a grab I did want to uh, play you about more details on Labour's plan for childcare. What I was talking about was the permanent shift that we need to see where we treat early years education and childcare as an integral part of our education system. That is the permanent shift that I want to see on a scale with the NHS because what we have in this country is early years education somewhere over here, not integral to the education system. That is very different Sounds from most of the European countries. Alongside that, making sure that where we're putting more money into the system, the government did did respond to what the pressure that we'd been applying and put more money into the system at the budget. That gives us a better baseline from which to build a better system that will support parents. Well, let's bring Sam back in, shall we? Um, I feel like the language on childcare, that this is going to be a reform like the creation of the NHS, is not really matched when you look at the policy from Labour. <laughs> no. Um... I've sat through a lot of interviews that you have done with Labour front bench politicians, Sophie, and just, and it's not you, it's them. Just so much of the content uh, just just falls through your fingers as they dodge the kind of hard facts. The hard facts that Bridget Phillipson's willing to talk about are is the breakfast breakfast club commitment that there will be access to a breakfast club for every kid uh, from nine months to eleven years old. Now, maybe this week, maybe Keir Starmer will announce something bigger on childcare. Of course, Jeremy Hunt, uh, the Conservative Chancellor, uh, in the last budget put a lot of money into childcare. Labour have been kind of boxing and coxing and working out what their updated offer is. So, so maybe Bridget Phillipson just didn't want to uh, steal uh, Keir Starmer's thumb. Um, but 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 there is often a frustration at uh, just how little specific there is to sort of cling cling on to after an interview like this. La Labour Labour had their own idea of what they were going to do in this interview. They were going to announce the two year. Uh, the plan to give a, a sort of one-off bonus to new teachers after two years. That's the, that's the new fact that they've got funded out of their plan to, uh, to raise taxes on private schools. That's the nugget that we were allowed to know. But, but yet on the much bigger question, we, we got neither the plan nor the principles, because I don't think the rhetoric were actually principles. It was just kind of rhetoric. I didn't really know where it left me clear in that interview about at all where they are when it comes to teachers pay at one point she said that the 6.5 percent that we're expecting the pay review body to recommend would be a good starting point for negotiation and i honestly wasn't clear if she meant it was a good starting point and they'd be preferred to go higher as the teacher unions want as mary bastard said she hoped or if they meant that would be the teaching union's starting point and they would have to try and wilt them down neither did i i mean i kind of Felt, I sort of felt for Mary Bowstead, uh, who, who, was, who, was, who was making that point. But, but it comes back to this thing. What do Labour want you to notice of that interview? They want you to notice that they are not writing blank cheques. Um, they know, 
and you know and I know that come the time of the next election, the Conservative Party are going to run an argument that Labour will bankrupt the economy if they get into power. And Labour is doing everything it can to try and insulate themselves as best they can from that charge by looking tough. So they're not signing up to even pay review bodies, pay review bodies that they uh, uh, kind of, you know, promised to adhere to uh, the recommendations of in the past. And so they sort of want you to hear that they're being tough. But then they add in this little rider, which is, but remember when we were last in government, we did give teachers and doctors a lot more money, uh, but we're not going to promise that now. But remember what we did last time. And they're hoping that the public kind of join the dots without them making uh, actually a formal promise of more money at a time where there's almost money, no money left. So, again, you know, it's triangulation. It's an attempt to give everybody a little bit of what they want to hear. But the biggest message is that they want people to hear is no, you can't automatically expect to get big lump sums in order to try and nix that core argument on the economy that the Tories will make about the Labour Party over the course of the next year. Um, the final thing that I just want to ask you about is a reflection, I guess, on the interview with Mary Balstead, the head of the National Education Union. I mean, she was pretty clear, wasn't she, that these strikes are continuing, that they're unhappy uh, with the pay offer from the government. And then, of course, with Steve Barclay as well, talking about junior doctors, there is no end in strike, end in sight. That was a very uh, good Freudian slip there in strike um, for that one either. I mean, just how difficult is the situation with these industrial disputes? I mean, it's. I mean, it's. It's. It, it, it is incredibly difficult because the NHS disputes are having a direct effect on people um, getting treatment and on waiting lists and on the performance of the NHS and on morale in the NHS and patients' ability uh, to get very urgent uh, help. So uh, when it comes to schools. Every time a school shuts down, uh, it's not just the teachers on strike, but parents very often kept at home, uh, not able to do their job, a real hit on the economy. And yet, you know, the, even though the government is announcing an NHS workforce plan, dealing with the strikes, you know, sorting out the issue on pay, it, it is deemed not part of that because... They don't want to pay more because it might fuel inflation, even though the link between inflation uh, and public sector pay is, is indirect. It needs to be sorted. It's difficult. It, it, I find it baffling that it's not, and it really hurts. Um, really good to uh, talk, as always, Sam. Stan Coates there, uh, talking from his uh, South London um, office. Good to see you uh, on this morning's Safe Ridge on Sunday. The podcast will follow around lunchtime, so do check that one out. See you next week. <laughs>